Okay, uh, I want to welcome everybody to our uh, time together. Uh, we had a little bit of a, a technical glitch there for a while, but uh, seems to have been uh, uh, dealt with and is under control. And um, uh, two of our number have, are not able to join us here this evening. So I want to uh, uh, welcome everybody who will be joining us online and we'll uh, get ourselves started right after we pray. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord, these are important conversations. Things don't change unless we change. Things don't uh, become better unless we become better. So be a part of our conversations as you have promised, for we are gathered in your name. And where two or three gather in your name, you are in our midst. We are grateful and ask for your presence to be assured. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen. Okay, now what we are, where we are right now in the in the course of history is um, just before the onset of the Civil War. So you'll begin to see some um, some things happen that uh, drive the uh, uh, the Civil War into place. Well, there's Jane. So uh, I think we've uh, gotten something under control, but uh, we're we're moving ahead now toward. Uh, um, the Civil War itself, and one of the, uh, well, I'm going to let him unpack this for you, uh, because uh, he's much better at it than I am. to Union and Confederate forces. But you know, the battles for the Civil War didn't just happen in places like Shiloh and Gettysburg. In many ways, the Civil War was a battle over the Bible too. Historian Mark Knoll writes in his book, The Civil War as a Theological Crisis, and he talks about Lincoln, and Lincoln gives an address during his presidency toward the end of the war. And Lincoln captures the dichotomy of understandings of the Bible between Union and Confederates by saying, both Union and Confederates read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes God's aid against the other. The prayers of both could not be answered, and that of neither has been answered fully. The question was, for many people, was God on the side of the Union or the Confederacy? Well, one example in the Bible helps illuminate that question. In Joshua 5, it says that Joshua asked the commander of the Lord's army, are you for us or for our adversaries? And the angel of the Lord answered him and said, no, but I am the commander of the Lord's army. The idea is that God's not on either of these human-made sides. God is for God's self. But when it came to the Civil War, on whose side was God, the Union or the Confederates? It depends on who you ask. I'm going to pause it there because there's a story that, that came to my mind that fits in nicely here. And that is, um, uh, there was a, a preacher who was visiting the White House uh, during Lincoln's time. And he asked Lincoln uh, the question, aren't you glad that God is on our side? And Lincoln said, it, it seems not so much uh, to, it's not so important for us to understand whether God is on our side or the other side for that matter, but that we are on God's side. That twists that, that thing in, in such a proper perspective that uh, I think since we just heard a quote from Lincoln, I'll just go ahead and add it here and uh, now we'll move on. There were competing biblical interpretations and they ricocheted like bullets across the landscape of the church. So in this segment, I want to briefly recount some of the events leading up to the Civil War. I want to unpack this concept of sectionalism and particularly explain some of the theological justifications put forth in support of slavery and the Confederacy. 
This section also describes the schism that happened between every major Protestant denomination, the Methodists, the Baptists, and Presbyterians, over the issue of slavery. And throughout this conflict, Christians of both Union and Confederate forces believed that God was on their side. We'll see how that plays out. Now, before we get going, two facts you have to understand about the Civil War. The Civil War was America's deadliest war, and it remains so to this day. Between 650,000 and 850,000 died. That came because this happened right at the influx of technological innovations, which made guns and cannons more deadly. But up to two-thirds of all who died, died from disease. They were in stuffy tents and they had poor sanitation in their camps, so the soldiers died of dysentery and typhoid fever, pneumonia, smallpox, and gangrene. But you see, over time, the context and the causes of the Civil War have been obscured. What we must know about the Civil War are two facts in particular. Number one, the Civil War was fought over slavery. And don't let anyone tell you different. A lot of people like to say it was fought over states' rights. Well, sure, in a sense, it was fought over states' rights. But the states' right to do what? Hold slaves is what the Confederates were arguing. And people at the time knew this quite well. Just read the articles of secession of states like South Carolina and Mississippi. The second fact we need to realize is that tens of thousands of Christians fought to preserve and defend slavery. We're talking about compromise here and the color of compromise and the American church's complicity in racism. And so we have to take account of the fact that for the soldiers of the Confederacy, they were fighting and even dying to preserve the institution of race-based chattel slavery. Now listen, there were other factors for sure, but the main issue still had to do with the protection and expansion of slaveholding as an institution. Now, during the war, everyone knew this, and it was really only later, especially with the rise of the Lost Cause mythology, which I'll talk about, did people begin to obscure the salience of slavery to the Civil War. Now, the church, which has this command from the Bible to love God and love your neighbor as yourself, they failed to see black people as their neighbor and fought and died to preserve the enslavement of other image bearers. And furthermore, they justified their stances through what they thought was righteous indignation and a slanted reading of the Bible and what they thought was divine permission to hold black people in captivity. In other words, they justified their beliefs through scripture. But the antebellum way of life had to fall and the Civil War was the sledgehammer that knocked it down. As we talk about the Civil War, let's do a little bit of historical context so that we understand the causes and consequences. There are a lot of things that led up to the Civil War really uh, over decades, but there are five events in particular. Number one is the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which enforced laws to say that if someone escaped from slavery to freedom, that person could and should be returned to the plantation where they came from, which again, like the Fugitive Slave Clause in the Constitution, meant that no place in the country was safe for a black person. A second event was the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, which is again, sort of this balancing act and this compromise between slave and free states and which ones would be which. Another important decision is the Dred Scott decision of 1857, which I'll talk about further in detail, and John Brown's raid in 1859, which frightened slave owners because here's a, an, an example of armed insurrection. And lastly, the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860 was for many the last and final straw. Let's highlight just a couple of those events. Let me talk about Dred Scott. Dred Scott was born enslaved in Virginia in 1795. Now, he labored for his enslaver in free states. He would follow his uh, slave owner and do work with him in these free states, the territories of Illinois and Wisconsin, for instance. And Dred Scott's reasoning was that since he had gone to these free states and worked, that he should also be free. Uh, the male slave owner died and Dred Scott sued uh, to have his mistress let him buy his freedom and that of his wife and child, but she didn't let him, so he went to court. And that 
case went all the way to the Supreme Court. But Judge Roger Taney wrote the majority opinion. In that majority opinion, which ruled against Dred Scott, he said black people were, quote, an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race. He went on, Judge Taney, to say that black people had no right which white men were bound to respect. This meant that black people had no recourse in the courts and no rights as citizens. That was one event that precipitated the Civil War. Another was the election of Abraham Lincoln. Now, Lincoln was a Republican, but don't think 21st century Republican. There was a party realignment many, many years ago. And so in this time, the Republicans were generally on the side of abolition and the union. Now, Lincoln, who's been hailed as the great emancipator, even by black people, was far from a racial egalitarian, especially prior to the Civil War. In fact, he objected to the expansion of slavery, but he wasn't interested initially in actually abolishing slavery. And he certainly didn't advocate for civil or social equality of black people. In the Lincoln-Douglas debates of 1858, Lincoln said, I am not nor have I ever been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. Doesn't sound like much of a great emancipator there. But the election of Abraham Lincoln told officials in slaveholding states that their time was running short and they had to do something. And that's one of the causes that led them to secede. Back to this point about the Civil War being fought over slavery. If anyone has any doubts, look at what South Carolina, the first state to secede, said. In its documents, it said those non slaveholding states, meaning the Union, have assumed the right of deciding upon the propriety of our domestic institutions and have denied the rights of property established in the 15 states recognized by the Constitution. Beyond just the political factors, people in the Confederacy saw slavery as a moral and a spiritual issue too. Folks in the South criticized Northern states because they denounced as sinful the institution of slavery. And Confederate leaders were saying, no, it's not sinful. Also, if you had any doubts that the Civil War was fought over slavery, Mississippi and the Articles of Secession say our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest of the world. Now remember the chattel principle, the turning people into property principle, and the Mississippi Articles of Secession saying that slavery was the greatest material interest in the world. But it goes on and it elaborates about the presumed inferiority of black people. The articles say none but the black race can bear exposure to the tropical sun, as if there's some biological bent or disposition of black people towards slavery that uniquely suits them to the institution. Now, the splits we're talking about in the Civil War were more than just regional splits over North and South. They were also ecclesiastical splits. And so the Methodists, Presbyterians, and Baptists all split over the issue of slavery, again, along sectional lines, North and South. So let's start with the Methodists. And it was founded by John Wesley, who himself was against slavery. But as the denomination grew in the United States, it also grew more socially conservative, especially on this issue of slavery. So, for instance, in 1844, the Methodist General Conference split along sectional lines and the anti-slavery vote actually won. In a 110 to 69 vote, Methodists decided to censure their bishop, James Osgood Andrew, as long as he continued to hold slaves. Basically, they were saying you can't be a bishop in good standing and a slaveholder as well. Andrew and his allies withdrew from the MEC to form their own convention, the Methodist Episcopal Church South, or MECS, and they allowed their bishops to practice slavery. So the Methodists split over slavery. But the Baptists, too, followed a similar course. Like Methodists, initially they left the decision about slaveholding to lower levels, not in terms of regions, but individual congregations. So we talked in the previous session about 1790s and the Baptist General Convention there. 
Like Methodists, Baptists initially left the decision to lower levels, in this case of Baptists at the congregational level. But also, like the Pharisees of the Bible, some of the Baptists in the South wanted to test Northern Baptists. So, in 1844, at the Georgia Baptist Convention, they put forth James E. Reeves as a missionary. Now, Reeves was also a slaveholder. Missionaries had to be approved by the Home Mission Society, and this council, this committee, the HMS, they had to decide whether to accept him a slaveholder as a missionary. And if they accepted him, they would also tacitly be endorsing slavery for the whole denomination, and to reject him would reveal a bias toward anti-slavery. So they tried to avoid the question altogether, and they said, resolved, that it is not expedient to introduce the subjects of slavery or anti-slavery into our deliberations, nor to entertain applications to which they are introduced. In other words, they didn't want to get baited into this debate. But Baptists in the South didn't leave it alone. This time from Alabama, they submitted another resolution. And this was more straightforward in the demand that the National Convention clearly state its position on whether slaveholding was a sin. Was it truly a matter of indifference for congregations to decide? Or did slaveholding have moral gravity to make a denomination-wide declaration? Well, this time the Home Mission Society responded more directly. They said, if, however, anyone should offer himself as a missionary having slaves and should insist on retaining them as his property, we could not appoint him. And they went on to say, one thing is certain. We can never be a party to any arrangement which would imply approbation or approval of slavery. So in May 1845, Baptists in the South split from their northern neighbors, and you get the birth of the Southern Baptist Convention. There's one more split I want to talk about, this time with the Presbyterians. They were the last ones to split in the early 1860s, and again, this was over an issue of slavery as well. Gardner Spring was a minister, a Presbyterian minister of Brick Presbyterian Church in New York City. As the Civil War approached, he aligned himself with abolitionists, and in 1861, he proposed what is called the Gardner Spring Resolutions. The resolution said this, It is the duty of the ministry and churches under its care to do all in their power to promote and perpetuate the integrity of these United States, and to strengthen and uphold and encourage the federal government. So you see, Gardner Spring wanted Presbyterians to clearly align with the Union and the anti-slavery cause against the rising tide of the Confederacy. Now, Presbyterians in the South saw this as a direct attack on them, and they opposed the idea that allegiance to the Union could be a condition of Presbyterian membership. So they viewed separation as the only option. Part of the problem was that Christian abolitionists had an issue when advocating for the end of slavery. You see, if they wanted to use the Bible, the Bible never explicitly repudiates slavery. Indeed, many of the godliest people who Christians look up to as an example, they held slaves themselves according to the biblical record. Now, Southern Christians exploited this fact to defend American race-based chattel slavery. Not only did the Bible not condemn slavery, but it actually provided guidelines for the regulation and practice of enslavement. So Southern slaveholders challenged abolitionists to cite chapter and verse where the Bible explicitly condemned slavery as wrong. And therefore, the Civil War actually became a battle of how to interpret the Bible. For example, Southern Methodist preacher J.W. Tucker wrote in 1862, your cause is the cause of God. He's talking to the Confederates. The cause of Christ, of humanity. It's a conflict of truth with error, of Bible with Northern infidelity, of pure Christianity with Northern fanaticism. It made acceptance of race-based chattel slavery a requirement of biblical orthodoxy. In other words, if you want to be a good Christian who believed the Bible, then you had to advocate slavery. This was put forth very eloquently in a theological work by a man named Robert Louis Dabney. He was a Southern Presbyterian minister, and he directly served General Stonewall Jackson. And he wrote a book called A Defense of Virginia and Through Her of the South, which was published just after the Civil War in 1867. 
In that book, he used passages from the Old and New Testament to explain why supposedly the North got it wrong on slavery and why the South's defense of slavery was justified. He said, was it nothing that this black race, morally inferior, should be brought into close relations with a nobler race, meaning white people? Dabney said that black people tend toward lying, theft, drunkenness, laziness, and waste if left on their own. He then went on to explain the supposed benefits of slavery. It introduced Africans to Christianity. And he says, and above all, was it nothing that enslaved blacks should be brought by the relation of servitude, meaning slavery, under the conscience and Christian zeal of a Christian people, meaning white people. You see, in Dabney's mind, the gentle ministrations of the whip had the salutary effect of commending Christianity to black people. Never mind the fact that Christianity had long been in Africa prior to that, and perhaps there could have been more effective ways to evangelize non-Christian people than through enslavement. Now, had Dabney personally experienced slavery, he might have come to a different conclusion about it as an evangelistic mechanism. As we talk about the Civil War and Christian defenses of slavery and fighting on the side of the Confederacy, it should give every citizen and Christian in the United States pause to consider how strongly ingrained the support for slavery in our country was. People believed in the enslavement of black people so strongly that they were willing to form another country, fight a war, and die to defend it. And throughout it all, Christian leaders and lay people alike looked to the Bible to justify their pro-slavery stance. And they made sophisticated theological arguments for it and believed that God was on their side. The Civil War paints a vivid picture of what inevitably happens when the American church is complicit in racism and willing to deny the teachings of Jesus to support an immoral, evil institution. Okay, uh, so uh, welcome back, Dave. Are you on with us? Good, good. Yeah, so glad. Can you hear me okay? Yes, wonderful, great. Um, so uh, there's so many places to jump on and off here that uh, um, I don't quite know where to begin. Um, uh, before we, we got started, I, I showed the uh, um, or before we viewed the video, I showed the, uh, the, one of the justifications that uh, Southern slaveholders used to uh, suggest that it was fit, fitting to um, employ slaves. And um, that was the curse of Ham, okay? uh, where uh, Ham was uh, supposedly chastised by his father Noah. And uh, as a consequence is was relegated to a lesser uh, position uh, socially as well as uh, perhaps racially. Um, as we s said at the, at the bottom of the article that I showed you, there's no real justification for that. Um, that uh, and quite frankly, it's um, been a position that's very easy to move from. There's no, there's no curse of ham. <laughs> um, but uh, nonetheless, it was seen and used in that time uh, as one of the justifications why people would be allowed to hold slaves. A second one was uh, actually best spoken of in, in this video by the uh, pastor from, who was pastor to Stonewall Jackson. Uh, I've forgotten, I didn't write down his name, but uh, he, what was his argument that uh, suggested that slavery was acceptable? He comes at it from a an evangelical perspective. What does what does he what does he say? Anybody catch that? That was Robert Louis Dabney. Yes, that's it. Yep. Yeah. He suggested that it was almost destined that an inferior race should be under the influence of a superior race. Now, just imagine that, just imagine that. 
uh, and and that was the evangelical argument that um, isn't it good then that uh, having been brought to be in touch with the nobler race that these then were turned Christian isn't that a good thing um, so that's kind of a, a moral position again ridiculous but but nonetheless, that's the point of argument. And then there was uh, a third uh, justification for slavery that had to do with what we call dualities. Dualities. Um, the, that is the uh, ability or the, or the, uh, the philosophical mm -hmm. approach to things that come at it from two different perspectives. Um, Remember, I think last week or the week before, we talked about the duality of pietism versus social justice and how John Wesley was, was, a, was definitely into the pietist movement, but he said that there's no way that one can be a, a follower of Jesus without making a difference in, in, your, in your social outlook so that you cannot separate uh, these things into dualisms cannot have one or the other. It's, it's a both and. And, and. and so there's a couple of dualities that are spoken up here that uh, become important. One would be, um, there's a difference between the physical and the spiritual. Now, why would that be crucial to an understanding of slavery? What, 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 what do those two perspectives bring, forming a dualism that, that impact uh, one's uh, view of, of slavery. Physical versus spiritual. Hmm. Don't make it hard. Just because, because one, let, let, let me work this one out and then maybe the next one will be easier. Just because one is physically enslaved doesn't mean that one is spiritually and so again bringing the two together notice how being physically enslaved affects your understanding of being uh, of slavery of, of your being altogether so that as long as i'm physically enslaved i i will not have i will have a dehumanized concept of myself okay now the uh, the the other dualism is moral and political. Now work those out, work those out. Moral and political. We just, we just passed through and, and I'm, if, if you're someone who, who loved and voted for Donald Trump, please don't take this because I know that there are a lot of people out there who, um, who like his policy, but don't like him. <laughs> okay, so, so, but how does the moral and political form a dualism for, for the purpose of slavery. Okay, is that a fair question? Think hard. Think of it from the standpoint of the, of the Southerner, because this, this is an excuse that they're using, the moral versus the, uh, of the political. Let me let me go to um, our uh, our prior president. What what is the greatest moral um, criticism of uh, Donald Trump? Whether you voted for him or not, it's almost undeniable. Say again. Am I in that dangerous a territory? Nobody's going to talk. His, his treatment of women, for one thing. Well, that's one thing. Yeah. His treatment of work, his workers, and not paying bills, not. Okay. His his <laughs> his business style. And his truthfulness. Okay, that's the big one. Wow, well, he's very biased. Lack that's, of truthfulness. Yeah. The, the, the big biased. one is. The big one is his constant of, um, 
abuse of the truth. <laughs> um, so, so that's, that's, that's the moral. That's the moral side. And how do you go about the work of separating that from the political side? Um, do you use people's fear? There's a professor up at Messiah College who wrote a book uh, after uh, Donald Trump ran for president. And the name of the book is Believe Me. Okay, so you, you got a guy that's constantly feeding you this stuff and, and asking you to believe him when politically he's demonstrating something altogether different. Okay, I'm sorry, Pam, I interrupted you. No, I just think in terms of how he uh, got people to vote for him by telling them the things, um, uh, immigration, that was a big thing in America uh, in terms of, of people coming here and not doing it the right way. And he used that uh, fear, uh, telling the Americans they're not gonna have a lot of things that they let a lot of, of foreigners come in uh, undocumented. And just, I think he just used that fear. To me, I'm looking at this immigration just like a black people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're using the fear to, uh, of people to say, you let them keep coming in, they're gonna do all these things. We're spreading propaganda that's not true about an individual group of people is what he did. And that separates people. Whether you um, believe in his policies or not, you may want to uh, deal with the immigration things that we have, but you can't separate all the things that he's about when you vote for him. You can't pull out you know, those things. You mm -hmm. were looking at him for one thing and he just you know, pulled you along with these other things. So for me to look at how um, he's divided uh, uh, American groups of people uh, by feeding them, you know, information that's not correct. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's that's the clearest statement of the moral affecting the political. Uh, right. The, the political end of of the immorality is a divided country. Okay. So, so you begin to see these dualisms at work when, in fact, you cannot separate. If if you're looking for uh, uh, candidates, you cannot separate the moral from the political. If, if you do, it, it, you, you will lose both. You will lose both. You've got to hold people morally accountable. And, and if, if they are immorally, immorally handling the political, then you've lost both. And so the dualism is, is, is so crucial to put the dualism away and embrace them as, as one. Uh, one more, and this has to do with the church, is the ecclesiastical, uh, the ecclesiastical and the social. Uh, and he treated this. Anybody catch something that might we might bring to light here, where, where the ecclesiastical piece um, uh, uh, was was easy to compromise, so that the social piece is is lost. What were what was the let's let's use the Methodists, okay? Ecclesiastically, we had a bishop. What was what was the issue with the bishop? He yeah. couldn't have slaves. Yeah, he had slaves, and they were trying to keep him uh, from practicing his his uh, bishop duties, and uh, and so they were trying to hold him both both uh, uh, ecclesiastically and socially responsible. And uh, consequently, they, they even at general conference in uh, 1844 took a vote. And in that vote, uh, it was overwhelmingly on the side of the North that he should be held ecclesiastically responsible and he should be held socially responsible. In other words, you cannot practice a bishop, as a bishop until you care for this social matter. And they voted overwhelmingly uh, in support of that. But what happened? It split North and yeah. South. They split the Methodist Episcopal Church South. Split so that so that the, they the um, uh, the uh, uh, ecclesiastical side of it was compromised by the social side and held as a dualism. Whereas again, the ecclesiastical and the social side should always be together. They should be linked together. There should be no dualism there. And and. What I'm trying to get you to see is there were three means by which uh, slavery was justified by, by the South. One was the curse of Ham, 
second one was, gee, it's great that uh, these uh, these inferior beings uh, both both uh, um, uh, physically, intellectually, and and spiritually are now in touch with the superior uh, race. And then the third one were these dualities that they kept presenting and and tearing apart. If you like I said, if, if you are only a pietist, then you're missing most of what Christianity is about. And if you're only a social justice issue, but you're not in touch with the living God through piety, you're missing. What it's, and so all of that has to go together. OK, I hope I didn't bore anyone to tears on this, but it's a it, it is a crucial issue for us to to see what's what before the war, what was going on that caused the churches to separate, that causes the, 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 United, the colonies, to, the United States to separate. It's, uh, it's quite frightening, actually, to, to see this uh, division going on. Um, what, uh, what other things did you see that uh, we need to uh, talk through? I have a few other things, but I, I don't want to dominate uh, all of this direction here. Are you as angry as you were last week? I'm sorry, Pam. No, just in, in observation that um, people can easily be swayed if you say it enough times, put it in their mind that somebody is lesser than a, another person or minded than an individual. Mm -hmm. um, what's the easiest way to sway people? either for the good or for the bad. Constantly giving them, constantly telling them things. You know, yeah, well, you're on, you're on the one edge of it. <laughs> um, how is this going to impact me financially? How is this going to impact me financially? Um, like we could go all over the world on this one, but, uh, um, and that's, that's one of the great issues that, that uh, mm -hmm. the South was dealing with. Uh, you know, essentially, why did the church split? It had nothing to do with what was right or wrong. You're, you're messing with my, my livelihood. Yeah. And yeah. It's, 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 it's frightening. We may come back to that. It's a, but it's a great point. Any other observations? Were, were, I was about to ask, are you as mad this week as you were last week? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. I'm glad you're, glad you're still angry. Glad it's burning hot. <laughs> Do you think this is bad now? Wait till we get to uh, the, the Jim Crow era. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Unbelievable. Um, anything... Uh, you know, what made you mad um, as you watched tonight? <clears throat> what makes me mad is that um, if you're supposed to be living by the Bible and believe in the Bible that everybody is created equal, and you're supposed to treat everyone, you know, in a loving way. So when you start looking at uh, colors, it, it, it changes everything or anybody's... Um, uh, I would say weakness and, and, and look down on them. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to start looking at uh, <laughs> uh, using their color or anything that you don't like as a way of, uh, of making them feel indifferent. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to talk about, you know, as I uh, uh, listen to then and what's going on now. It feel like... Um, it, it hasn't changed in mm -hmm. slow, very, I mean, I look at technology, how technology changes fast, but in terms of acceptance of people is very slow. It, mm -hmm. it, it was interesting that both sides were trying to use the Bible to justify their position. Yeah. And, and felt that there was justification within the Bible for both positions. Well, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> um, I'm looking up a verse here. 
Um, but yes, uh, I mean, yeah, that was that was a problem. Um, that uh, I'm sorry, sorry to divert my attention here. You know, so I, was, searching. I, I was thinking how in, in the Bible we're taught that, you know, that the church is the body and that no one part of the body is um, any less important that, than another, that we're really, we have to respect the entire body. And so I think that's kind of, that's how I feel. So I'm hearing uh, uh, these um, comments that were made back in the day and they're saying well it, because of the color of their skin they're less valuable but if they're really part of the church they're equally as valuable so it's i, I don't know that it makes me angry to hear that yeah uh, um again what um what finally is the is the clincher that drove the churches apart. It, it it's uh, it, it all, and this is true. Um, <laughs> this is true uh, in uh, in modern churches as well. I, I uh, when I was district superintendent, I occasionally would have to go into church. I had uh, I had eighty churches and seventy pastors plus or minus uh, that I was supervising. And, and uh, occasionally I'd have to wade in on, a, on an issue and uh, it was almost always with regard to money. <laughs> Somehow or another, it always, always trickled down to money. Um, when we um, went at the business of our new building, um, uh, we had a, an 83% positive vote, which is, unheard of practically, but those who, who were not interested in it um, pretty much boiled it down to, to money that uh, they just didn't think we could afford it or, or weren't able to uh, muster the resources to over time take care of our, take care of our, our, uh, our obligations with the bank. And so, uh, you know, it's a, uh, it, it would be wonderful if, if everything would be divided along spiritual lines, but it's not, it's not. Um, and in particular, uh, particularly in the North South issue of, of slavery, it was, it was financial, it was economic. You're messing, you're messing with my livelihood and uh, drove the church apart. Well, the South, didn't have the technology the North had. The North was financially able to create a lot more jobs and do a lot more things and make a lot more product. Mm -hmm. And the South had this one thing, the cotton, you know, and we have to have people to go out in the fields and we have to have people do all this work and we can't afford to pay them. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was about afford to pay them. They didn't want to pay them. They didn't probably want to uh, move up in terms of technology and advances until they were made to do it. Once they were made to do it, they did it. They survived. And they thought this, like you said, it's all about money. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting uh, thing to see what happens after the Civil War. Um, how did the South survive now that their labor was all gone? Um, how, how did that work? But I think, Gil, you're right too. Uh, that. There's a great fear of, will we be able to, to do what we've been doing without the current system that we have? Um, but as, as Pam said, somehow or another, it, it came together. Uh, I, I do think that um, one of the things that began to happen was the industrialization and the war force this to happen too. The industrialization of the South became uh, more in evidence. But notice how we're talking about money or, or the economics, the, the drivers of, of culture uh, will, always be, will always be economic. And it's, 
it's sad and, and scary, but it's a reality that we we have to live with. Um, let me just get a modern day example. So $1.9 million has been passed by the House of Representatives. Now it's in the Senate. Debates going on all over the place. And you can watch it pay attention if you like. Um, some of you don't like. <laughs> Let me encourage you to do something you don't like. But um, the, it's interesting as they've done these polls, how many Americans are in favor of this 1.9 million billion uh, 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 stimulus package. And it's well into the 60 percentile that of people in favor. Now, let me just ask you, why is that? $1,400. <laughs> I would say after working for 40 years, I feel I deserve any and everything that is owed to me because I've always given to the government. So now that the people need it, give it to us. All right. All right. Uh, you know, but why are people so interested in this? Well, you know, you're starting to put your finger on these pieces, but some people are just watching that $1,400. And, <laughs> and some people need that $1,400. I'm going to get $1,400. Do I need it? We deserve it. We work for it. It's a pandemic. Yes. But yeah, I deserve it and I work for it. But when I get it, I'm going to give. I'm going to give it away. <laughs> it, that's your choice, though. But as an yeah. American citizen, because I don't, I don't need it. But but notice but how notice how yeah. economics drives the the opinion. That's what I'm mm -hmm. trying to get at. Uh, yeah, I mean, the well-to-do say no, not the poor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you have it, you're not going to say anything. But uh, if you don't have it, you're going to want it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I'm in between. I really uh, don't need it. But if I really need it, I would be really uh, banging my hands, yes. Sure. But I'm not well, going to knock somebody else. There's no doubt there are people who need it and need it desperately. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, well. the rest of us, I'm not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> but notice what I'm trying to get at is notice what drives the opinion. And the same is true in the South. Same is true in the South. Um, I was looking for the verse, and I'm sorry I couldn't find it. I was looking on my phone, and uh, it's not always the best search engine. Um, but biblical, it, sa it says, consider others as better than yourselves. Uh, I think Pam was pushing, pushing that that button about you know notice, I, and Dave was too about the how both were using the Bible to. To, uh, to make their case. Consider others as better than yourselves is a, uh, a biblical um, command that uh, we need to be paying attention to. Um, any other observations, things that you saw that you wanted to make sure we, we flagged and highlighted? Mm -hmm. If nothing's jumping in your mind, I wanna give you one. Um, and I'm gonna do a, another share screen. And um, this, is, uh, this has to do with economics. Uh, okay, okay. And uh, it also has to do with uh, the, uh, the issue of, uh, how we, we go about the business of, of mixing, um, you know, what is, what is godly versus what happens politically. Uh, and this is an incident where Jesus is, um, is in front of the people. It's not too far away from uh, his crucifixion. And we read there, uh, then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples along with the Herodians. I have to minimize this because it's overcrowding out my words here. Um, Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? 
But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he asked them, whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. Now, the, uh, the uh, purpose of, of that is, again, to, to notice that there's a dualism going on, uh, that, um, that the, the scribes and Pharisees, the Pharisees come to trick Jesus, and uh, he sets this up so that the dualism is between uh, the Roman uh, government and, and citizenship in the kingdom, a render unto Caesar, and that which is Caesar's and under God, the things that are God's. And uh, the, the, the things we begin to see happening, uh, again, economically, are, are rendering um, or a failure to render uh, unto God those things that are God's. Um, and this business of, uh, of Caesar versus God becomes, uh, and, and he lines it out, uh, let me get here to the uh, place where that's found. Uh, for Tisbe, Caesar had clearly declared that enslaving black humans was acceptable um, uh, to Caesar. It was acceptable to Caesar. Uh, for instance, um, uh, citing the majority opinion of Supreme Court in the Dred Scott case, Tisby documents that black people were of an inferior order and that the constitution did not have black people in mind when it outlined the rights and duties of citizens. Black people had no rights to which the white man was bound to respect. The portions of the church on, on the other side uh, where you would expect God to be honored, portions of the church advocated for the abolishment of slavery. He concludes that countless, listen carefully, countless devout Christians fought and died to preserve it as an institution. We heard him say that, and we heard the judgment of the Supreme Court justice that wrote the majority opinion, uh, Roger Taney. And so we see Caesar being rendered to, and God is increasingly ignored. If you, if you, if you are taking, unless you take the position of the inequality of the races, that, that blows that whole argument up. But as people, and I think I know all of you well enough to say this, um, as people who see the equality of races as a very important concept, it, it makes no sense um, to, to separate Caesar and God. Again, a dualism set up that, that needs, to be, needs to be brought uh, back into, um, into, uh, into concert with one another. Um, so uh, rendering to Caesar that which is Caesar's and unto God that which is God's is a, uh, a way that uh, for us to uh, perhaps handle this economic business that's going on. Okay, uh, that was another point. The, the last one that I heard Tisby say was the... Uh, uh, after the uh, presentation by the Virginia pastor, uh, Mr. Dabney, about the nobler race, the white race being the nobler race, um, Tisby said, the gentle ministrations of the whip had a salutary effect to win the slave to Christianity. Is that, is that, is that making any sense? Um, that, uh, that, that, uh, so, you know, I, I, uh, I think we all join together in our anger again that uh, we even have to think um, in these categories. It just, we hope that we got, have gotten far beyond that. But I, every time you turn around, then maybe we haven't. Maybe we haven't.
I, uh, that's all the material I brought along with me tonight to add on to the video. Um, but I'm happy if, uh, to, to, uh, to talk about more things that, you know, if you're, if you're stricken right now with a, a need to uh, process something, I, I certainly don't want to shut down yet unless you do. I think there's been a lot more attention given to the racist problem since uh, the black movement and everything. I just heard yesterday or saw it in the newspaper also about six Dr. Seuss books won't be published now because um, Dr. Seuss Enterprises listened to feedback from audiences. So there are six books that depicted racism and they're not going to be published any longer. Mm -hmm. And then um, in the Sunday news, there was an article, a new chapter surviving eyes, chain, eyes changes in religious lives of black Americans. And one of the things it said is there isn't a black heaven and there isn't a white heaven. Mm -hmm. If we think we're going to heaven, who do we expect to be there? All whites? Mm. There's no black heaven and no white heaven. Mm. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm thinking, would I still be a Christian if I were treated that way? That they're trying to convert them to Christianity? Would I want to be a Christian after being treated like that by the white church? Mm -hmm. It's so painful. They certainly have a lot of faith. It's painful. Yeah. Uh, when when you were district superintendent, Roger, how many of those uh, uh, eighty churches were black or none? 50 50 <laughs> no, none no there were no they, they were they were, were all no, white no black church all they were all uh white in their nature um i know i had no black pastors um there were uh congregations that were mixed largely urban um so uh no uh, when we when we began our study together uh remember we said that Sunday morning is the most segregated hour of the week. It's and we had some we had some pastors who really really made a strong effort to try to integrate the, the, the congregations, um, but uh, uh, it's hard work. Very Do hard we work. have any black congregations in Dallas Town of any any denomination? No. No, none in Dallas town. Um, the uh, when you when you work when you when you uh, look for black denominations, you're going to have to go to into town, into York, and you're going to see um, uh, uh, the AME, the African Methodist Episcopal, uh, the Church of God in Christ. Uh, you're going to um, see a number of Baptist churches. Uh, by the way, the same is true of the Hispanic community. Uh, the, uh, they are also segregated. One can understand that a bit more due to potential language barriers. But uh, other than that, uh, no, it's, it's a segregation, it's a segregated hour. And um, in many ways tragic. Uh, I live across uh, the street from um, a black pastor uh, who is, uh, curiously enough, uh, the pastor of Bethlehem Baptist Church. And uh, I've had a conversation with him. He's currently pretty ill. Uh, my conversations um, uh, were largely to try to get him to uh, have a relationship with another Bethlehem church and uh, maybe uh, get some of those conversations going. Um, and I'm still not say, saying that's done, but he's ill. He's, his, he has a, a pretty severe heart condition. 
his wife, by the way, is uh, a student, was a student of Palmer Poff when Palmer worked at the Red Lion School District. So she is, uh, she lived out our direction in the Red Lion School District, but um, uh, is not, uh, you know, obviously when she was married and married a pastor, uh, she's, she's my neighbor across the street. So a lovely person. And uh, so I get on their website every now and then see what's going on. They treat their pastor so differently. <laughs> it's interesting. What do you get, cakes and pies? I'm sorry? You said they treat their pastor different. What do you get, cakes and pies? Uh, well, cakes and pies. Is that what I heard you say? Uh, yeah, you said they treat them different. I'm like, no, you I, get, I get plenty to eat. I get plenty to eat. <laughs> no. Um, uh, I'll try to get on the website and uh, flesh that out a little bit more for you. It's a, it's the, uh, it's an honor, a kind of an honor thing. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get the website out and, and show it to you uh, maybe next time, but it'll be before we get started <laughs> on our, uh, on our recording. But yeah, David, getting back to your original question, it, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, Evidence of the tragedy, you know, it's evidence of the tragedy. Uh, last time we were together, I think uh, we, we remembered um, the uh, two men who were, uh, for all intents and purposes, thrown out of the uh, Methodist church in, in, uh, in Philadelphia. And I showed you a map. Uh, that church was up in the north, about four or five blocks away. And they went down and they formed what is known as Mother Bethel, Mother Bethel AME Church. And I wish I'd have known its location before because my daughter lived uh, a block and a half away from there. I would have walked over there and checked it out. But um, ever since that moment, you know, it's evidence of what was going on and what continues to go on, sadly enough. Um, and maybe that's one of the breakthroughs that we need with the, uh, the current conversations we have about racism. Uh, uh, maybe Black Lives Matter will help to break some of those barriers down. Um, also generationally, uh, I have a lot of hope for the younger generations to, to uh, put things aside. Uh, let me just say some one thing and it's gonna sound bizarre. Um, I felt as though, uh, I came to the place where I felt as though I would be fine, absolutely fine, if my children were to choose to marry uh, um, persons of color. I, I just, I, I knew I would have to make peace in my mind about that, and and I have even even greater hope for for the generations that follow. Uh, that uh, perhaps that's going to be a way of of the barriers falling down. I don't. I'm not saying that as a, a crazy way of patting myself on the back. I just, it's just something that I came to a conclusion about. And if it were to happen, my parents, I don't know about my wife, but my parents would have asked some serious questions. Mm -hmm. But um, generationally, there's hope, I believe there is. Definitely. I have um, biracial grandkids, so I already know what it's like um, to have a mixed family. My daughter is married to a white guy, so my um, grandsons here are mixed, but I have uh, two other kids and they are not mixed at all. So imagine, you know, uh, coming together, family reunions has, has been going on for the last, they've been married 20 years. Mm -hmm. So um, having a um, blended family is just like normal to me. Yeah, yeah. So, so are, are both the uh the mixed grandkids and, and the black kids treated equally or are they both treated as black people and the rate experiencing the racism? Um, I, because the, the black ones live in DC and the mixed ones live here in, in Dallas town. And I think sometime back, the, the ones, the mixed ones here were having a little um, issue with kids, you know, saying things about their hair is not the same because my two grand 
sons look different. One has um, straight hair and one has curly hair. So they, you know, take on the characteristics of their mother and father. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, when they're together as You're muted, Pam. Pam. Pam, you muted yourself there. Something happened. You see. Uh, You're muted. You're muted. There we go. Now we're back. You were muted. OK, well, like I said, they don't see uh, color among themselves. They just uh, play together as you know, cousins, because they've, all, they've been brought up together. Um, so. It's only the outsiders that see that, not among themselves because they've been with each other since birth. So it's only the outsiders that are not family that look at them differently. Or if I have them, they look at them differently because they don't look anything like me or resemble me because even the complexion uh, of them, you know, so for them it's nothing, but it's just um, others looking from the outside in, you know, making comments right. about them. Not maybe, you know, thinking that they're part of the family. And my daughter gets it a lot. Are these your kids? Are these your kids? Mm -hmm. And then father gets it as to um, what is their mother? You know, people will ask that. And it should make a difference, their children. Yeah. Well, uh, hopefully as the generations uh, pass, it'll become less and less an issue. Um, I think it is. Um, time has really changed. Um, you know, cause I, I just think it's also where how you live and where you live at because me coming into Dallas town, uh, I would say 95% is white here um, with the other 5%, you know, like I said, the kids, when I go to the school, uh, I see a few black kids, uh, not that many mixed, but still the school is probably 90% white that's here. Whereas if you go to DC, it's going to be 90% black. Mm -hmm. Some parts of town, you know, uh, but this percentage uh, of black kids in DC is going to always be much higher, I guess, because of the, the demographics of the amount of black people there because they don't even consider uh, York as a, a, a black town anyway, it's Harrisburg. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so do the black people of Dallas town not go to church or they go in town for church? I don't know, I'm the only one there. Tell me about it. Well, how, 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 about, how, about your fa how about your family that lives here? Do they go in town to church? Um, they came from a Harrisburg and went to a different, they went to a, a Baptist church up there. So when I moved here, I'm just looking at the churches in walking distance. It didn't matter to me is whatever, um, because I still go to a Lutheran church as well that's across the street. So for me, I, I was looking for uh, not the, the denomination of the church, but what church had to offer to me when I come in to listen. Mm -hmm. So it didn't matter um, whether it was a Baptist or Methodist. It's just what uh, I felt comfortable there when I went, the message that I was receiving is how I chose where I wanted to be. Yeah. Yeah. So I've never looked for a black church in Dallas town, no. I don't even think I would find one in York that I would travel across. I'm not gonna, you know, travel to a place because of the color of the church. Mm -hmm. I might get there and not like what the minister has to say. So I'd rather, you know, I chose to stick within my community that I'm living. Mm -hmm. I think it's um, it's different growing up in a white church, living in a white community. Uh, now that I'm in Boston, at least more than half the time, I now attend a Baptist church, which is about 50% black, uh, maybe 10% Hispanic, a couple Asian. It's a very mixed church. It is a very warm and loving church. There is no sense of any you know, inferiority or superiority. It is so refreshing to be in a multicultural situation, but sometimes here we don't have the opportunity to, to have this dialogue. We have Pam. I'm so glad to see you, Pam, but I wish there were more of you. <laughs> you know, I wish that we had this ability to talk more 
with people that are different than we are, at least, you know. It's the community. I, you know, I'm walking around and I've been here almost two years and um, I haven't uh, met another black family, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. in two years, um, you know, because uh, my, my family that I'm with, my, you know, my daughter's the only other black person that I see face to face, um, you know, so I'm one, I, I don't even wonder because I already know the community that I moved into, uh, what the diversity is. So if mm -hmm. I was looking to want to be um, around more black people, I would have to, you know, look to like I say Harrisburg or places where those numbers are high. You know, DC is a transient area, still majority black, but um, on one side of the town you have black folks and then on the other side of, of DC, you have a uh, majority white, but right now because it's a transient st uh, city, you have some of everything everywhere. It's eight wards in DC, and you would say half and half. And it used to be, um, you know, ninety percent black. Well, now DC is not that anymore. Uh, those numbers have really dropped, uh, maybe fifty percent. Mm -hmm. So that just goes to show you, you know, um, how times have changed, and people are constantly moving, and you know, um, gentrification, gentrification is taking place. Um, you know, uh, cost of housing. Uh, is, is going up. So that's going to knock a lot of people with lower income out of certain areas. And I mean, I think I see that's how uh, Dallas town is. You have to have a certain income to live here. And that's any certain, you know, uh, communities when um, they don't take an account for, um, you know, a lower income. I'm quite sure they're probably low income housing here, um, but you're not going to see it like in the bigger cities. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that and giving us a snapshot of uh, your circumstances and Gail for the place where you are uh, in Boston. Sounds exciting. Okay, uh, last call. <laughs> Any other uh, commentary sparked? Uh, let's all do what Cindy did, by the way. Keep checking the newspaper if you see an article of interest that, that uh, um, kind of speaks to our uh, circumstances today and the topic that we're addressing, uh, don't hesitate to bring it up. And uh, it's always helpful to, to get the uh, current events in there, uh, I think. Well, let's pray and uh, we'll uh, um, conclude our evening together. Lord, it is troubling in so many ways uh, to sense the uh, the historical movement of, of the treatment of other people. Unfortunately, when we look across the world, it, it still remains. As we've seen uh, whole villages killed because of the difference that they have from the other. And it's frightening to, to imagine how it might be uh, rejuvenated in our country in too many ways. And yes, we hopefully have enough righteous indignation, enough of a sense for who you are and who you want us to be that we will take our stand and hold fast. And when it appears in ways that are unjust that we would speak. Thank you for this conversation of the evening. Hold us fast. Allow us to think and ponder what we have seen and heard and continue to talk and look for opportunities to talk with others. We pray in your strong name because our strength continues to fail. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Thank you all. Uh, Pam, we're sure glad that you came and parked with us for a little while. Yeah. Amen. And, I enjoy uh, it. Uh, good, good. I think we have a sense of humor here. <laughs> so it's enjoyable. All right, uh, folks, um, um, keep praying, keep thinking, and uh, love you all. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.